Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second Google Hangout with Miriam Rivera, the former VP at Google and our illustrious CEO for the Kaufman Fellows Academy. I'm Rusty Dornan again, once again moderating, and hopefully this time we'll be able to take your questions live and not have to do a follow-up. Now, for this week's assignment, it will be developing systems, and as you know, the assignment involves a pivot or a change in direction for the company. Because after you've laid a solid foundation and developed your operating systems, if you have to adapt and change direction, it's going to be a lot easier. And so Miriam's going to take questions around developing systems and also around changing direction in a startup in those early stages. Miriam, how common is it for startups in that first year to have to make some kind of adaptation or some change to sort of tweak the direction they're going? Well, I think it's extremely common because the reality is that you're generating a hypothesis for what a business might be or how customers will use and adopt a new technology. And those hypotheses are completely likely to be wrong. <laughs> Uh, one CEO uh, that I have in my portfolio, his name is Pablo Fuentes, he wrote a book about how he lost $2 million, and part of it was trying to find his um, target market and the use that his customers would really put his technology to, and he felt that if he had spent more time talking to the customers and less time ideating his product alone, he would have been way more successful and would have uh, used the first two million dollars to build something that people were really going to use um, as opposed to um, creating something that he thought was going to be a great product. Of course, hindsight is a hundred percent, but in this case again, you know, how important is getting feedback and developing a system for getting feedback from customers, from the marketplace, and that sort of thing in the beginning? It's extremely important. Um, and the reality is that most of the time you're not going to uh, you're trying to develop a product and what you don't want to do is develop that product in a vacuum. So the companies that we've seen that have been most successful are like really out there and interacting with their target end users right away. They're developing hypothesis in, you know, in conjunction with their end users. Um, for example, one of the companies in our portfolio called Remind 101 that I think did this in a really um, great and super scrappy, um, dollar-efficient uh, way was they were developing a Twitter-like capability for teachers that would be compliant with um, FERPA, which is a, a federal law related to the privacy of student information. They quickly um, found teachers through social media and Twitter itself who were interested in potentially piloting this project product um, with them. And from the very beginning, they were incorporating real teachers using the product with real students and real classrooms, real parents. And so they were getting feedback right away from teachers, and they were developing a product that was meeting the different needs of those teachers and parents. They were getting um, also people that ended up loving the product so much that they were um, sharing with other teachers the, that this was a product that they might want to have. And so essentially they became their first customer advocates as well as their um, test users. And I think that that kind of close relationship has you know, served them incredibly well as they went from you know, 0 to 10,000 users, zero to, from 10 to 100,000 uh, users, and then within a year and a half to about a million users. Wow. Um, for the assignment, uh, we have the pretend company Meet 'em Up, which is a mobile app where the, initially they felt that the, the product would involve people checking in in locations and meeting with friends and doing that kind of thing. And it turns out that the only app that people are interested in are, is the photo app and the liking app and that sort of thing. You know, what are some of the steps that a CEO could take at this point when you see an example like that? Uh, what should, kind of steps should the CEO be taking immediately 
when they get the metrics back that customers are just not interested in these other apps. So one of the things is you should be gathering data and actually reading it. <laughs> um, that's actually part of the first hurdle that customers that that companies have with respect to their customers. They're often so busy and pulled in so many directions that they actually aren't um, looking at that customer feedback and that data that they're getting. And they're not trying to figure out what does it mean, and they're not actually talking with customers about what does it mean. And I think that if you, um, first off, are trying to track the right kinds of data, actually reading that data, and then trying to get interpretive information from your customers about what does it mean and why is it that this is what you're using, et cetera, um, that that's kind of the first um, and most necessary part of trying to figure out what people sometimes call a pivot. Um, but oftentimes a pivot is, uh, is, okay, we've lost a lot of money somewhere else and so we're going to do something completely different. Um, what I think of in terms of adaptation and learning from a hypothesis generated point of view is we have been engaged in a customer development process um, with our technology that allows real users to use it and we are actually getting real feedback about that use and we're taking the market's information and using it to develop our product roadmap and sometimes that product roadmap actually goes to a simplification. In fact, this is a pretty common situation where um, you've created what you think is going to be this beautiful product and it's got all these different bells and whistles on it and you find if you actually are examining that data that only one feature is really being used and used heavily by people and being used by more of your customers than any other. And then I think the thing to do at that point is actually talk to your customers. Like, what are they using this for? What's their experience of it? Um, what do they think of the rest of your product? So there's a lot of um, systemic approaches to trying to interact with your customer around what the data is saying. So you can really interpret what this usage information is about. What's the most important thing a startup CEO needs to communicate to his employees when they're when he's implementing, he or she is implementing a change in direction that could have powerful impacts on the company? Well, what I like to see them doing is both having, um, you know, one, it can be a real disappointment and it can be a real problem for certain people that have already been hired that you're taking a new direction with your product. So one, it's an awareness that there may be apprehension about change. There may be fear of people losing their jobs if you're moving in different directions. And three, that you may have to convince people that this is the right way to go and that if uh, certain organizational changes are required, that that is going to be for, every, for the benefit of all in the longer run. So you've got a, a really hard job uh, to do in getting your team aligned with this newer vision or this adapted vision based on hopefully both data and then a sense of how it aligns with the vision that you have as a company and the passion that you brought to your uh, your original product and the passion that you have around the market that you're trying to serve. And you basically um, often have to communicate how this adaptation is really getting you closer to what it is that you had as an original vision, even though it may be a different product direction. Right. And then how do you communicate the fact that you're going to make a change to your investors? How important is that? How quickly do you do that? Do you have to get their approval before you start launching something? How do you handle your investors when you're, when you're doing a change in direction or a pivot? Well, typically, I would like to see people um, going to their investors uh, with this kind of data, um, with this story that shows, you know, what they've gotten in terms of traction based on the usage that they're seeing um, with this particular feature, oftentimes, of a product that they've already launched, and how that kind of outstrips whatever um, they've launched as a whole product and how and then that they've actually researched the market for this let's say um, 
this technology that is now more closely aligned with a particular market or market segment. Because I think the thing that investors will fear is that by sharpening or focusing your product, you may actually decrease the size of a market. But if you can show that, one, the market that you're pursuing is the same or as large, but that your adoption will be faster within that market, I think that goes a long way to overcoming some of the hurdles um, and some of the opposition that you might get from investors. Typically, um, because it is a strategic question, what market are we pursuing? Who is our target customer? I do think that you um, have these conversations in advance of uh, making these changes and that you incorporate um, a story around your product development and the team and what's going to happen to them and, and also the financial piece. If you're going to uh, make these changes to your product, um, how does that affect the amount of time and the burn that you have left to actually uh, bring that product to market and be able to reach certain milestones that might be important for getting a next round of financing? And, and how much of your sort of new strategic plan should you be unveiling? Should you really be, you know, I know Matt likes to uh, say that he likes to, you know, keep it pretty open and transparent. Would you also uh, suggest that people know what you, the new goals are right away and know what that plan is? Or do you kind of just do the rallying cry and then, and then make it up as you go along? You know, I think it can depend a lot in, in terms of where you are with investors and how many you have and what stage you are in. So, for example, um, you know, when you're a really early company and you're a seed stage company, you may be working really closely with one of your investors as an advisor. So, hopefully, this is not news to them, <laughs> you know, that you're finding that the product is getting certain kinds of usage and not others um, and they are helping you to think through as well what that market looks like for that particular product now that you are hopefully more laser focused in terms of um, what its functionality is and how what its adoption looks like and what the cost of getting users is for that particular product and how those might vary from the initial vision that you had. So, you know, my sense is that um, let's say you're a seed stage company and you may not have anybody that you've really interacted with substantially um, in terms of developing your product, then these conversations uh, may not be uh, as interesting as conversations where you actively have more ongoing relationship with your investors because Sometimes seed investors are basically saying, well, we're going to invest in you and you're going to figure it out. And they kind of understand that there's a lot of figuring out that's going to have to go along with that early stage investment. But then other times you have people who um, really are investing in a particular team, in a particular product. And frankly, I've seen a number of startups uh, both offer to return uh, funds to investors where that's been the case uh, because they want to have investors that are on board with the direction that they're actively pursuing and with the team that they're actively pursuing uh, it with. And so, you know, I, I think there's some discretion here, um, but normally I am definitely in favor of transparency um, and openness because your in early investors are often advocating within their social networks, within um, their communities around your company and or trying to bring you opportunities. So if they really don't know where you're, which directions you're moving into, they can be a lot less helpful to you. Okay. Also, we do have some people who have joined us and we are, I think we'll be able to see your questions. So please do submit any questions you might have to Miriam Rivera about developing systems and also uh, changing direction and a startup in the early stages of a startup. Um, Miriam, let's say the aspect of the company uh, that you put the most effort in is just not getting traction um, with customers. Um, you know, what about this freemium uh, model? You, you know, there's a lot of controversy about offering the product for free. What do you think about it? So, there is, 
there are really good reasons to sometimes move from a paid model uh, to a freemium model. And in large part, it's often driven by competitive reasons. So you're in a market that you've developed enough traction in that it looks like an attractive market for other entrants. And part of what you're trying to do by moving into a freemium market is to get enough market share and to essentially do a large enough land grab that perhaps this installed base has reasons for why they will not try the next product and why they won't necessarily try the next startup that is doing something. So typically when we see companies moving to a freemium model from a paid model, it's all about trying to get user, it's about user acquisition and traction and the fact that um, they can uh, win a market or um, potentially get growth capital on the basis of how large the market is that they've been able to penetrate so far. And, and if you see a company that's in a space and somebody else is gaining, especially because they have a freemium model, um, you'll often see people that had a paid model moving into a freemium or offering some different product on a freemium basis to be able to get um, brand awareness uh, and user traction. But does it make your customers angry when you, you know, when you go from that freemium model into wanting them to pay for something? Is that, is that worth it in the long run? Well, one, we're seeing it uh, sometimes where a company has been offering a product that customers are paying for and now the pivot, if you will, is that they're going to offer it for free. So usually what happens is that they're offering that product for free to their existing customers and they're offering a differentiated product with more functionality for a premium or a price, right? So sometimes what you're hoping is that the product that you're offering for free um, is not meeting well, the product that you're offering for a premium is something that your customers value the premium features of so much that they'll continue to pay you and not be upset that you are giving other customers a free product. So there's a fine line to walk there in terms of working with existing customers and attracting new customers. If the, and you know, I think that the premium product has got to offer so much value that compared to your free product, it really is, you know, let's say an order of magnitude better and or provides them functionality that that they absolutely need to do their job well, but that other customers may not need to the same extent. And so therefore this differential pricing works for them. Okay. We have a question from our teaching assistant, uh, Joe Vasquez. Uh, what do you think about the recent trend in acquisitions and how does this factor into the life of startup CEOs? Well, I'm pretty sure everybody's just talking about WhatsApp <laughs> as opposed to any real trends. Um, but yeah, it's the talk of the town, right? Um, and so obviously acquisition um, has been for probably the last decade the premier um, exit opportunity for startup companies in Silicon Valley in particular and on obviously in other parts of the world as well and even from other parts of the world into Google or Facebook or whatever. So you have like a Waze acquisition for example from Israel uh, uh, into the US and that I think is a, you know it's a very long term trend. In terms of um, pricing uh, I read an article where one CEO who um, was running a very successful business uh, was saying, oh, you know, this is depressing. I really, and I'm talking about the WhatsApp uh, acquisition, and I've got so much work to do to try to make my company that valuable. And, you know, I think the reality is that you have to look at your particular market and your opportunities, and you have to really execute against that market and that opportunity. And the market will determine the price of an acquisition both on the basis of your traction, uh, whether it be in terms of users for consumer-oriented um, applications or if it be in terms of revenue for uh, later stage uh, acquisition. And the you can't necessarily compare one type of company versus another and think that if you just work harder 
you're going to create a 19 billion dollar exit for your company because I think that's just a not an intelligent way of looking at it based on what the um, market potential is for any given product. In addition, you have to do what people do in any acquisition uh, scenario, which is they have to try to get as many possible bidders for their company as they can. And in a relatively short period of time and within the legal scope of the agreements that they sign with a company. Uh, and if you do that well, the pricing of a company can be dramatically impacted um, by the development of alternative acquirers. And that's just, that's not a trend. That's just business 101. So uh, how often should startup teams have all hands meetings and does this change as the size of the team grows? This is from Brendan Apple. Well, my sense is that a startup company, one, it, there are different kinds of meetings that should be going on in a company and typically early on they tend to be functional meetings as opposed to company-wide meetings. So if I think about um, the people who are working on the product or people who are working on the marketing and business development side, um, they're probably in frequent contact with one another and you know, to be honest, you may not need that many formal meetings when you are uh, starting a company because you are working often side by side and on the same things with other people that are in your company and there just isn't that much of an ability for information to get lost. Uh, I remember just being at Google in the early days, like I would know what was going on because I could hear all the conversations in the hallway as I walked by and you know I would be sitting in my office at like midnight or 2 a.m. and people would be there and we'd just chit chat for a little while before kind of breaking up for the night and you had a lot of informal access to information. As the company grew I definitely instituted more regular meetings and frankly even within areas so like let's say I ha by that time I was um, uh, I was a very senior manager at Google I had about 160 indirect um, reports in my company and about seven direct reports uh, and I would have direct report meetings uh, weekly with that team that I was in charge of and then I'd often have matrix type meetings with people for example, our European office or and the people that worked with them or our regional offices and the people who worked with them. I would have um, meetings across different types of consumer products um, or enterprise products. So it depends in terms of how complex the organization is, how many weekly, uh, how many meetings. But I would say that you want to have a weekly comm meeting and that's something that's pretty standard in, in Silicon Valley. It's often called happy hour <laughs> and it happens on a lot of times on Fridays and you know this is an opportunity for people to get brought up to speed in areas across the company and to have an opportunity to socially interact and as you keep growing the company this kind of events end up becoming more and more important train going by <laughs> um, the uh, printer going on <laughs> use that uh, folks out there but um, so Long answer, it'll depend a lot, lot, but I do think that every company needs kind of a weekly comm meeting. But, you know, nothing's worse than the boring all-hands like you said, all hands meeting and doing them off-site is always a good thing, but are, are there any other tips for sort of getting people engaged in company meetings, some tips for facilitating, increasing people's buy into the meeting, that sort of thing? Well, you know, I think that the more real information that people are getting, the less that you have to worry about getting people's buy-in. And, you know, early on these meetings can be highly important and open book uh, management approaches. I think one of the harder things is getting buy-in when you can no longer actually share with your staff things that are now considered material uh, non-public information, for example, as you grow a company into a public company. But early on, depending on how open book management you want to be, 
for a lot of people, it's very interesting for them to hear from functions that are doing things other than what they do every day to get briefed on what is going on. So, and that the buy-in happens because they're able to be more impactful in the business because they understand what others are working on and how what they do fits into that. So for example, I would work on deals and I would have an opportunity where people would kind of understand we're working on this kind of a deal, um, you know, we're going to have to have input from engineering, finance, from uh, sales finance, from uh, sales engineering about how this partnership is going to get formulated and you might get a call from me at any hour of the day or night and would you please make time for that call now when people would hear this and I'd call them and they would be in the middle of jogging on Saturday afternoon they would you know stop their running and actually answer the question because they understood that the potential impact to the business was you know a hundred million dollar deal or a billion dollar deal and that the work that they were doing was really material to the success of our company and to what others were doing. So it's early on, I don't think this is hard because you can share a lot of information with them. I think it's much harder when you can't share true information and a lot of things become platitudes. Um, but none of the folks in this at this stage in the startup CEO class have those problems yet. Is it, you know, going back to the pivoting uh, concept, is it, you know, are there, is there too many, is there a problem if a, a startup CEO tries to change directions too many times? I mean, is there a limit? Is there what kind of things do they need to think about before they really implement these changes? Um, I mean, will they be seen as too frenetic, in other words? Absolutely, there's the potential for that. And... My sense is that, you know, I've, I saw one company go through three different products before they hit a product that really got traction in a market. And I have to say, if they had not achieved some sort of traction at product three, that they would have probably lost all credibility with those that were investing in them and those that were serving as their advisors. And the thing was that it was product three where I think they engaged in the most active customer development process, the most active hypothesis generation. They were the most proactive in terms of talking to real customers, um, trying to find out what they really would want in a product and they weren't just creating something and then testing it out after the fact. So yes, you can lose all credibility if you don't get to some sort of user traction and you need financing to continue to explore markets. I think it's a really a hard situation to be in because you'll likely see um, either no interest from investors because they'll choose to write off you know, why put good money after bad? You write it off or you will get um, terms that are much worse than you would have gotten if you achieved some sort of market traction earlier um, and had made better use of the financing that you got in the first round. Great. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for joining us again um, and answering the questions about developing systems and pivots. I did have a couple of things if people watch this later, some other students happen to watch this. Uh, we did give an extension for last week's assignment for gr the graphic organizer, which we had neglected to upload. So those are due on Wednesday. We really hope you will submit those. Please remember to review your fellow students submissions, uh, give peer review feedback. As we've been talking about, when you have a startup, feedback is very, very important and this class can really be instrumental in helping people figure out uh, their concepts, their proof of concept, that sort of thing. So please take the time and review your other, uh, other teammates and also other student submissions on some of these assignments. Also next week, 
Uh, we're proud to announce we're going to be having in a Google Hangout Eric Ball, who is the treasurer of Oracle. And he is also a KFA instructor. He has a class called Mini MBA, Unlocking the Ivory Tower. So we'll be announcing the date for that with Eric Ball, the treasurer of Oracle, next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.